This is a production of Cornell University. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm, um, it's, you know, landscape architects um, are very excited to start, you know, reaching out to different publics. And um, I can tell, um, I see just only my research associate here. <laughs> Lauren Butts, who is following the seminar, I can tell that there are no landscape architects in this in this room except the two of us. So I hope that um, um, my thoughts and um, some incipient insights of my ongoing research um, can be useful to the discussion that you have been developing the last um, the last weeks. Um, as I, I especially th uh, thank um, Peter uh, for. Um, having the, you know, risking um, uh, quite a lot to, to invite a newcomer uh, to the States, but I hope that, you know, my, my, my experience in a completely different um, environment with different traditions and, and policies and probably um, less um, for the moment affected um, from severe um, storm surges um, uh, could, could give, um, I don't know, an interesting um, perspective to the, to, to the discussions. Of course, it's an ongoing dis discussion. I cannot, um, I think, presume in an hour to, to discuss things that are really complex. But as, as the title um, of, my, of my presentation um, suggests, um, I would like to talk about three different things. Talk a little bit about the coast as a cultural contra construct. Um, I want to be, in a very simplified and very brief way, talk about some very interesting initiatives which probably you're all aware of because they have been receiving uh, quite a lot of attention from, from the press. And then show you know, some, some ideas uh, in regard, uh, you know, to what we are doing right now or what we are supposed to do. So, um, uh, Peter already mentioned why, you know, we should be interested uh, on the coast um, uh, under the circumstances of, of this era of the Anthropocene or, you know, the climate change. Um, I, I just show this um, this image from from a very um, um, let's say interesting and, and very contemporary design in, in in the south of Barcelona, uh, just to let you know that um, uh, we have been um, trying, we have been introducing uh, new design tools, and we have shifting to a new paradigm. Um, towards the design of the coast only very recently. You can see, uh, you know, this, this, I think, brave and interesting attempt of the designer uh, to um, create, to go against the intense privatization of the coast, get rid of, you know, parking lots, and create uh, interesting um, um, public space, and at the same time uh, try to, uh, give space to you know, the wind and the sun to create a very interesting landscape which has been affecting the aesthetics of, of coastal landscapes. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go so much on the details. I don't know how is the policy, but you can have the... But I mean, there are always so many data about you know, why the coast is so much affected because of, of it's uh, you know, one of the most important urban areas of, of the earth. Um, it, um, because um, uh, it will be, you know, um, we will have many coastal disappearing destinations. And at the same time, I want to suggest that, it ha that has, the coast has been a, a, a landscape that we haven't discussed uh, deeply, uh, especially, um, and it has been um, introduced um, in terms at least to disciplinary terms 
to design terms and planning terms uh, through the discovery of, of tourism. Um, I wanted also to, to, to insist on an idea um, that it's very, I think it's a common ground for landscape architects and, and planners and environmentalists, but probably it's not as um, um, known uh, that um, landscape architects and designers and planners uh, that have, uh, have been um, already since the late 60s and uh, in, with more intensive efforts, I think since the 80s, to try to change the protocols of development of, of, the, of, of the coastlands um, worldwide. So it's not that we have waited you know, for a term like um, climate change to, to try to shift our protocols. By the way, I should say that we find that climate change is a, a huge alley for, for landscape architects because for finally, um, all our efforts to, you know, to change things, talking to deaf clients and um, uh, sometimes you know, um, corrupt um, tourist industry and sometimes also corrupt municipalities. Um, now we have, we have um, kind of, um, Founded and grounded uh, reason to to be to be heard. Just to make a little bit of, of history, uh, this is a landscape declaration. Uh, many of us uh, tried to to write. It's very difficult to define what our role is in a page uh, that happened last June in um, the University of Pennsylvania, and um, I was honored also to to participate in uh, in some of the of the working panels, and in a way, um, you know, we, we wanted to show our commitment uh, in order to translate what the scientists, um, naturalists, sociologists, and I'm not going to uh, talk about, you know, all the different disciplines that are involved with understanding climate change, and be able to translate their knowledge and to uh, bridge uh, this this knowledge to making of, of spaces, you know, for the earth and for the society. Um, this declaration was um, uh, a kind of also of a celebration of 50 years of a former declaration in uh, 1966 by Ian McHark. I don't know if uh, this person is familiar to you, but he has been a Scottish of uh, Scottish origin landscape architect that landed after the Second World War uh, into the state as many others. And uh, with um, his colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania, they uh, protested, you know, as a, a clear, I think, demonstration, a manif manifestation of um, what landscape architecture should, should be uh, and how um, the, the, prof the profession would be involved in in the improvement of our cities and of our of our regions, no, um, you you can imagine most of you were not born in in this in this decade, but the 60s was an important um, um, awakening in terms of environmental values, and it has been um, a, a kind of landmark for um, different kinds of. Of I think of um, attitudes and and actions uh, in order to build um, and shift paradigms within the the discipline. So the things that we are doing now they were not uh, evident before, not even in the 90s when I started um, you know my, my when I studied and I started uh, working. So this is um, um, it's and, and it's Spanish and I uh, on purpose left it like that so you can see that Ian McHarg was. Uh, in his book, Designed with Nature, in 1969, he, um, he was translated uh, widely, and uh, that was a very influential book, and also a method, because today I would like also to explain to you some of our methods. I hope it's not so boring, just in the end, and, and very briefly, but uh, with you know, visualizing and mapping uh, regionally our, our landscapes, uh, Ian McHarg and his colleagues had the faith that w we could plan better for the future. Many things happen in between. We, we, are not, we do not trust so much this linear method 
methodologies any longer. But because we are in, a, in an era of you know, big data, of trying to cooperate, coordinate our actions in a kind of uh, interdisciplinary way, I think that uh, the figure of Ian McHarg and many other colleagues that echoed his efforts uh, in the world um, um, are very important to remember. Um, because of you know the, the the collection of data, the first um, visualizations of of, uh, of our territories with the um, with uh, let's say the the will to 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 plan and to ad advance and anticipate, um, not always with the same uh, I think um, aims. Uh, as we have now, but but still, yeah. So I started, um, um, let's say, uh, working in the coastal, coastal uh, leisure landscapes because Spain has been um, since the 60s a kind of um, very important laboratory for for ideas, for many failures, many failures. Uh, but at the same time, I think if you don't fail, you know, you never you never know how to to improve or, or, or innovate. So um, this, was, this is part of uh, Costa del Sol. Maybe many of you have been in Andalusia. Um, and this has been you know, the, um, the understanding of how can we uh, create this, you know, as I said, discovered and at the same time invented landscape. Because there was no, no idea, no real clue about how this, you know, tourist landscape should look like, you know. I mean, I don't have time to go back to all the, you know, the theories and understandings, especially from the hospitality um, and hotel design, but um, there is a kind of uh, common understanding, I think, and acceptance that, you know, there was lots of, of invention, you know, at, at that time. Um, so, but I also want to, Sorry, but I also want to uh, to to talk about um, uh, that there were some very brave actions at, at that moment. Of course, um, I should mention that um, in the early 70s, uh, Spain was finally getting out of a 40-year-long dictatorship that started after a very um, uh, cruel and still not totally, um, I think, digested civil war. And um, uh, so um, there were a very, a couple of, no, a few uh, naturalists, environmentalists, uh, planners, architects, and municipality leaders that understood that um, the, uh, the development of uh, the, the tourist industry um, was deteriorating, you know, absolutely um, environmental values, habitats, was privatizing uh, the territory. There was no um, um, relationship with, you know, the, the landscape character and heritage of this, of this area. So some of these of this people, uh, this is in Calvia, in, Maj in Mallorca, one of the Balearic Islands, was, was uh, you know, they were brave enough to demolish uh, hotels and try to, because the idea was, everyone understood that uh, tourism was a, a huge engine for economic activity, but um, not all of them were so brave to uh, acknowledge that we should really um, redesign uh, many of the things that were just um, uh, just developed. Also in, in this image, I hope you can follow, yeah, you do. Um, uh, this is, um, in, in that area, this is the north of, of Catalonia, up, up here, I'm sorry, the, it's almost the frontier with, with France, and Barcelona is in the south. So in this, in this area, uh, the same planners, Ricard Pien, and Rosa Barba, who I had the great opportunity to, you know, uh, be mentored and being her, their, their disciple and to work with them, were, again, uh, through interesting, um, uh, understanding of the economies of tourism, and understanding also uh, the you know the how the the local um, 
um, uh, let's say, popular movements, uh, environmental and, and cultural movements could leverage a change. So they liberated um, some of the areas of the very few wetlands that were, that were um, still um, uh, in place. And um, in, in my doctoral thesis, I tried to understand um, this um, in many, many maps. I'm just showing the, the, the map that you can see on, on the right, um, how you know, these uh, liberated areas or areas also that they were vacant and in expectation for further development could uh, play a very important role in um, uh, creating interesting buffers or connectivities with the existing um, natural reserves, which have all uh, been, uh, of course, product of the environmental movement uh, of the late 60s and, and early 70s. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, um, we haven't discussed, I think, um, as uh, different collectives, as different societies, as much um, about the... Um, about the coast, what we mean, what we, mean, what we expect. Uh, it has been um, a kind of recent desire to, to live, you know, to have a, a coastal experiences and to live uh, by the sea. In general, I mean, of course, there were always, you know, fishing villages and so on, but I mean as a, as a, as a modern uh, capitalist or even post-capitalist society. So, of course, there were so many authors, I just mentioned a couple of them, uh, who were very, uh, very explicit in the, I, I'm sure you have uh, the, the literature in the, um, in, uh, the reading, in the reading list I, I sent. So, um, and of course, like in, in, a, in a way of a very, very uh, simplified uh, understanding, it was like in the 18th century ma mainly that, you know, the coast started be becoming a place that was interesting for, um, let's say, the public, first the elites, of course, and later on. And it has been, according to Corbin, more, more or less like 120 years, which have been also very, I always, since I've moved to the States, I also think how important uh, this, this uh, middle uh, 18th century until the, the middle uh, 19th century was also important to the States with all the things that, that were happening here. So uh, for Corbin, it was like the, suddenly the, um, Natural theology decided that the oceans are, were not, you know, the, the hell on earth, and they were like part of, of God's creation. So uh, that was a, an idea that started shifting people, people's minds towards uh, the sea, who has always been a terrible place and difficult place, a place of, 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 of death, of pirates, of... Uh, and of, you know, the, the biblical flood, which, you know, remained and probably still is very important to, to our cult culture. The fruitful shores of Holland, like understanding uh, all this, um, well, the Dutch have always been very particular, but they have been making places out of this very dynamic interface. And of course, the fashion of the classical trip of the elites to the Bay of Naples. Anyway, um, I don't want to you know, argue so much about these three ideas, but I just wanted to tell you that has been very complex and very uh, broad, how this change, this shift to the desire of the coast. But I'm, I'm, and it's underlined in, in red, that idea that the shift from disgust and fear uh, to uh, an increasing desire um, uh, did not happen in a progressive linear ma manner and it has been, um, as in many other things, I think, in our, uh, in our cultures, um, that it has, they had coexisted uh, for, uh, you know, for, a long, for a long time. Um, so, as I mentioned, going back again to Spain, I will go from Spain to France and, and a little bit in, the, in New York. Um, uh, this is an image uh, of, um, of a village where, you know, the poor, the ones that had no land, they were just, you know, allowed to, to live uh, at the edge. And then, you know, the powerful dunes, which we have uh, silenced and eliminated from our coast because of the urbanization process that has happened, were, you know, just 
um, creating their landscape. And even if, you know, from with our eyes, we think that it's probably a gorgeous, wonderful, dynamic landscape, you have to think, you know, that you are someone that has no farm, that someone that has to live, uh, you know, with the sand entering, you know, in, in your house all the time. So um, I'm, I'm referring to, to how this landscape that was not productive, not valuable, that um, became through uh, this discovery of, of tourism, um, uh, a new source, an important new source for, for survival, and uh, not only survival, but also um, you know, having important revenues and also having uh, a great future. What I am, um, as a landscape architect and as a designer, very interested is that the the lack of um, inherited, uh, let's say, not inherited, I'm sorry, inherent values in the coast uh, made it a very easy victim to be understood as a tabula rasa, something, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase we, we use from, um, as a kind of analog to, um, from, from Latin to understand that, um, you know, uh, tourism uh, invented a new fictitious, let's say, um, or various fictitious identities on top of something that only needed some, some stabilization. So, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Greece and um, I sometimes I always think, or lately I think a lot that we only have our language. Um, uh, Greece is a country can, you know, feels like it's an illusion most of the time. But um, I look at, and of course, because I, I speak many languages, thank you for the compliment, but none as, as well. After so many years being a, a radicant, um, I, 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 I look at the coast and then, I don't know, um, it, it, the words show what we understand, and I, I'm not going to go into details of all the, you know, the, the specifics of, of its meaning, but um, it's always, you know, something that has been um, visioned from the land, and it's something that is uh, very close to, to a line, no? It's, it's something that, um, uh, it shows what we, what we understand when we are talking of the coast. So... I want to insist, because I know that you know, we have students of different backgrounds, that I, it's a profound paradox to, um, of, to, to desire to be in a space, you know, which is exactly characterized by dynamics and by uncertainty and ignoring this. It's, it's really, um, I think, a very um, profound indicator of the difficulties we have to understand in depth um, our relationships with the coast, the shoreline, the sea, and, and so on. So, um, well, uh, Corben says I really like that, that he said that we actually continuously move between Nausicaa and Polyphemus in Ulysses' long trip before arriving to Ithaca, um, between the seduction of the pleasures of the sea and the memory or constant third of danger. Anyway, um, it's not just the coast, it's the beach. I will be also very brief because I'm, I'm running out of time very quickly, but um, ethnographers and sociologists and anthropologists have been uh, astonished you know, by how the beach has become, I don't know, um, a contemporary heterotopy, uh, a, a, a public space par, par excellence, uh, even places that, um, cities that have no coast or, you know, they're struggling with the rivers to create uh, new beaches. Look at Paris or look at Toronto with the sugar beach. So I will only um, point out this understanding, you know, that of um, Urbain that he thinks that the beach is not the country, not a region with its own territorial traditions. It is rootless, lacking in inhabitants and in history. It is without identity, as it were, or rather like Robinson's Island, but as no pre-established identity except the one it is given by the individual who appropriated for herself. So I would like you to establish a connection, or maybe we can discuss it, between this idea of tabula rasa and then again the construction of um, a situation, I should say, I don't even know if I can call it landscape, that again um, only relates with what is happening within. 
Um, anyway, um, I think that um, at least from from the experience I had in, in Spain and, and south of Europe, but also in, in, in the Netherlands, and I, I, can, I have seen that also in, in at least in New York. Um, we, understanding and say our politicians and, and, and designers, you know, the, the importance of the new public space that, the, you know, the waterfronts or the, or the beaches have been, uh, we uh, shifted or we put all our efforts in, in trying to uh, improve the design of the wa water, uh, waterfronts and um, or marinas or, or whatever. So, um, so for example, in this in this very well known uh, project, which is very rich and uh, recent, uh, from some uh, Catalan architects um, in a, in the city in the tourist resort of, of Benidorm, it's evident um, the, the intention of oh, the, the city, the, the sea is still a, a kind of, of metaphor. The, the design language um, uses, uh, I don't know, the waves or whatever in order to, to create a new uh, fantasy or a new upgrading of a place that people um, uh, use a lot. But uh, as um, my research uh, associates um, have been trying to look here at uh, New Jersey, um, they were trying to map, for example, this is Asbury Park, many of you may be familiar with it. Uh, there is no real discussion, I think, except from some periodical uh, information at the, at, the, um, at the press of how much cost to build and rebuild are um, threatened by uh, punctual uh, storms. This is, for example, all the places that have been built and rebuilt, the casinos and the board works several times. Uh, for some reason, I, I lost the timeline here, uh, but it's, it's not so important. So um, for me, this is another paradox. We, we uh, de desire to spend time at the beach. We, as a society, accept that we have to allocate money in order to build and rebuild our our boardwalks, but still our boardwalks are waterfronts. They understand the coast again as a line, and they want to consolidate it again and again. So uh, I, mess, I missed a, a teether. It's not a shift. It's a shift, of course. It's through a paradigm shift from public waterfronts to waterscapes that humans will establish a new ethos towards the, the coast. And um, I profoundly believe that we are talking of a morality here. It, it's not only about um, um, you know, the, our economies and spending money, it's uh, how do, do we manage um, safety and how do we understand that other species, you know, of this, of this planet have a right to become part of this discussion as Bruno Latour, who visited us um, this, this fall, uh, has been insisting through his writing for several decades now, will be part of a new debate about the coast. Anyway, so I, I worked in this kind of coast all along the, the Mediterranean where, uh, you know, the, the, the tourist resort is a kind of incomplete project, as you will see. You can see, you know, how, you know, compact and still an expectation, you know, the, the, first, uh, the first coast, as I, as I talk about it, uh, how, uh, you know, this ca case is Valencia and there is a very important, um, uh, you know, uh, farming tradition, but how uh, the drainage, the hydrological uh, accesses are absolutely, it's all around the world, you know, canalized, and in the end, they um, produce many, many problems in the managing of the, of the ports and, and the marinas. And I, I've seen, you know, many floods, many minor floods, maybe not as important as, as you know, the, the storm surges that we had uh, recently. Uh, but they are constant, they are permanent, and they, they are, um, you know, not the latent memory of the site, but the absolute, um, you know, everyday um, uh, behavior, performance of the site. So I want to talk very briefly about, um, and this is like a more, um, I think, a personal obsession, uh, probably because I come from the school of, of urban design of, of of Barcelona, and we were, uh, uh, you know, we were very um, 
interested, and that has been our, our, our tool, our, our, our method by, by creating cartographies. And it has been only in the academy in several, I think, landscape architecture programs that um, very um, um, dedicated, I think, uh, colleagues, uh, teachers, they were trying to understand and teach the ne next generation how important it is to understand how processes um, um, transform uh, periodically um, in different time periods and scales our landscapes. But uh, from this like simplified uh, version, um, official cartographies are absent about, about the coast. We have very little information. Uh, the only, uh, let's say, ad adapted to the time scale information could be the FEMA flooding maps that, that we have. Nothing else, just a risk, you know, like only mapping vulnerability, but no one's talking about which are the landscape values of the coast. So um, I got tempted to show this, these maps um, because they were, they were published uh, recently, and I, I listened to a talk of a colleague from, from the Netherlands, Dirk Simons, and this is, you know, um, this is uh, another, another um, 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 version of it, like the advanced Western, uh, let's say, um, uh, societies, you know, of, of the Northern um, Europe. They are trying to map um, their um, energetic um, um, resources. And they are planning. And this is this is of course a project scale, but they're they're planning how um, a different um, vision for 2034 in this project of energetic odyssey. Everything has to do with Ulysses Ithaca, as you can see, around the world. Um, uh, and they and they are so so the so the not not exactly the coast because of the the, the scale, but. Yes, the sea um, is always um, basically mapped as, as something um, that depends on program, not so much of you know what, what is happening there. And this is a kind of uh, intentionally awkward um, set of maps. This is the area that I have been working with my research associates recently, and the area of Jamaica Bay, Coney Island, basically. Um, and uh, Staten Island and, and, and New Jersey. And you can see, if you try to work as a landscape architect, and maybe as another um, um, member of, a, of, another, of another discipline, you are always, um, uh, you struggle against the, the, the different set of data. You can see, for example, that uh, historical shoreline exists as a public access data for New Jersey, but they don't have uh, the, the inundation de data available. Uh, they, they, uh, the bathymetry is, is shown uh, in a different way and so on. So representation of our coast and the relationship you know, with, with the sea has been, and it still is a, a kind of struggle. So I would, I would talk a little bit um, quickly uh, for uh, you know, the, the proposal I have. Uh, I have been um, working basically in order to improve leisure landscapes with my students and with my research and, and some professional work. But I would like to, to tell you um, what Second Coast means. It means many things, apparently. I would like to think it as a kind of a flexible idea. But it occurred to me when I was uh, in a conference, in an architectural conference, when the, um, the, the very talented architect, Ithas Kuntintia, she's I think now in London or in Princeton, I don't know. She was talking that uh, the project that she would explain uh, was located to the third coast just below Tol Toledo. I don't know if you have a picture of Spain, but Madrid is in the center and Toledo is just uh, south to it, but it's very far away from the coast. And she called it the third coast for Andalusia. And so the idea of um, um, having um, like um, increasing in number of coasts 
uh, was uh, a very, you know, a very interesting idea in the late uh, 90s. The crisis, the economic crisis hadn't hit yet. There were so many people that wanted to own a house in Andalusia and uh, the retired people of the north, they could have, you know, they could afford to have uh, a small house and in the countryside, but very close to the beach to go wh wh whenever they wanted. So the idea of the third coast and the second coast depended on the new infrastructure that the country, uh, Spain, the central government would um, develop in order to continue with um, an amazing um, um, extraordinary, I think, uh, development um, for for second residence or for for vacation uh, homes. So, um, so I, and because I, of course, I'm a I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. I thought that the um, I should call my, you know, my research, I shall name it the second coast. I was hoping at that moment that the developers and, and mayors would be very excited about having more sites to develop and uh, that would, you know, uh, give me um, a, a chance to, to interfere in what was going on, but also because uh, of this lacking of visualizations that, that I think uh, also, um, 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 influence um, the the difficulty, the struggle we have to imagine new ideas for for the coast um, has to do with that. So, um, so I worked uh, intensively, and I and I, and I published, and the article I sent you have to do with this idea that the second coast uh, it can be a physical area. Of course, it is. It's the hinterland. It's where the landscapes are still wet. Uh, the, the, the memory of water has been silenced, but you can see drain, field, and so on. But it's still there. And uh, with climate change, it will you know, become a present often and often, and more often. But also, I think it's very interesting to, to think, at, at least for our discipline, to, to think of the second coast as a mapping tactic. So to try to understand where the historic coast was, to try to understand these identities, characteristics of, of the hinterland are still um, uh, evoke or um, a host, let's say, um, uh, the water. So also as a kind of a joke, uh, you know, that uh, the, the densely uh, developed and, and uh, used um, coasts are, are always, you know, we have the hotels and we know that depending on if you are British or if you are, I don't know, uh, Chinese or Greek or whatever, you have different um, um, traditions in understanding comfort and experience. So uh, that idea of multiplicity of water that has been translated in such a simplified, banal way and kind of scary because you, you have to imagine that the coastal um, tourist landscapes can uh, oscillate in um, in population a lot. You can have like places that have 10,000 inhabitants and then suddenly they could have 100,000. And so you can imagine during the summer in this changing temperatures uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean or in, you know, in Florida or, you know, uh, Mexico or San Francisco or California or all the places, uh, um, the most arid places in the world, how important, you know, is um, to be responsible without uh, and wise for with our um, natural resources, especially water. Anyway, so um, as I talked to you, there were many um, territories. This is the south of France. It's uh, Port Bacares. And uh, you, you will see that the sand barrier was converted as the, you know, the most um, uh, important uh, vacation resort. And then it was a complete uh, disconnection with the hinterland and then um, you know, the potentials of, of this lagoon. Um, I don't, I'm not going to show the projects now. There are, you know, these territories probably are unknown to you. I don't think it's important. But what are, the message I would like to, 
to live here is the importance to understand the evolution of the flow of water, uh, the levels of salinity, and we don't, for us, you know, that we are makers, we need maps for that. We need, we need information that is in scale, georeferentiated. We cannot only work, you know, with indexes or other kinds of information. So we really need, you know, as a society, if we want to rebuild and build in a different way, uh, or even not to build, but to to retreat, we really need to have this this different data. Or, for example, you know the the um, the um, a kind of a historic evolution of understanding of the different uh, you know um, qualities of the river and how they were feeding the lagoon and how you know the limits of the lagoon have been fluctuating. Also, of course, uh, the landscape, the second coast for me has been always a, a design narrative. For us designers, the, the analysis is part of the design. Uh, it's not just something, a description that we will you know, publish. We need to have proposals for that. So, for example, uh, and I will start with a project that won a, a competition and I, uh, I was uh, uh, only working as a, when I was a student at that moment uh, with my professors, Ricard P. and Rosa Barba. Um, that was uh, a, a kind of more, um, I think, uh, direct understanding of the potential of that idea of the second coast. So we are in the same area in the north of, of Spain, very close to France. Uh, this is Plaza d'Aro, this is the beach of the river Aro. Uh, the river is canalized. Uh, it's a dark slide, but maybe you, you can you can see it. A resort was built, a high density resort resort was built in the 60s, uh, when the fishing village of of this you know historical village, which of course expanded and became also industrial and so on. So fragmentation of the territory, uh, like a very excessive use of the resources, and uh, low quality, especially of what we normally call the backyard of this mature tourism destination, which means that these people um, um, were not getting, um, you know, uh, tourists that uh, were, you know, uh, unfortunately, after the 70s, the 80s, they were looking with low cost flights and so on, which affected very much the tourist industry, were searching, um, higher income, let's say, tourists were searching for, um, you know, more exotic destinations and not um, precarious and not interesting uh, high-rise resorts uh, in the Mediterranean. But we were also very interested in the fact that this area where the, the arrow shows, um, it, there were floods uh, from the inland um, um, happening every, every year and sometimes, you know, with, with horrible results. So we... And, and like myself, of course, as a, as a student, but the designers um, had that idea to, to create um, a new park for this area, a park that also the citizens could use during, um, during the whole year. Uh, well, of course, uh, I, should, um, I didn't mention that, but I mean, uh, the tourist resorts, little by little, especially after the 80s, and I can see that this also happens here in the States, have become um, desired places for people to live the whole year round. So we don't know exactly what is a tourist resort and, you know, if it's... Um, um, uh, you know, a normal residence for, for people. That is why um, we also, I think, in, in planning and in, and in uh, creating policies, it's, it's um, very complex. But this is the idea of um, a stormwater management park that would create a new perimeter for uh, maybe new investment for tourism, um, uh, interesting um, performance for stormwater, um, more public space for, for locals because, of course, uh, there was no public space but the beach. And also that idea of creating, which is in the end a kind of message I would like to discuss with you, uh, how to create values in more ordinary um, areas that are closer to the coast and try to shift, you know, a little bit um, and leverage a kind of gradual retreat from the first line, which of course it's, it's, it's threatened in various uh, ways at, at, at various levels. So um, we 
uh, we, were, we were working also of how this idea of the second coast can create um, um, new opportunities for uh, biodiversity, in this case, um, more wetlands, um, share in a different way the space with farmers and create a landscape structure, which probably you can see better uh, in that understanding, reveal the water that, that exists there, um, uh, create policies that could subsidize farmers if they, um, sh um, if they offer uh, parts of their, of their, of their uh, lots in order to um, have these places flat and you know, tourists could you know, pass by or, or kayak or also create energy in other places and so on. So the idea of the, of the, of the tourist project is an idea that has to be holistic. It has to be you know, developed with renewable uh, energy and it has to be um, always create new social opportunities, economic opportunities and, and environmental um, um, opportunities. But I was, I was uh, saying that before. Um, <laughs> I become optimistic, but then I look at these images. This is uh, in Florida, and I am I'm, I feel like uh, uh, very concerned. Uh, Florida and China, uh, mad architects on the on your left. Um, uh, so you know, architecture is still colonizing uh, the coast. It's still in the same way. I don't think there is any other type of, of, of landscape, of territory that has been developed in the same way all around the world. The beach, maybe some trees if we are lucky, an infrastructure that's very hard to move, and then development. And now this new architecture that what is doing is create a kind of artificial imagery and also, of course, promoting the, the view to the sea. You know? So we are still contemplating the only sublime probably left uh, sublime domesticated feature that we have, but uh, still in that way. But also important architects like Rem Kulhas from OMA or Foster, who in the 80s were really you know, uh, cutting edge with uh, their understanding. They participate in you know, uh, this idea of improving architecturally the coast without, um, I think, any, any concern of what does it mean to, to continue um, um, uh, building and, uh, in, such a, in such a threatened landscape. So anyway, um, I just have, I think, 10 more minutes, or maybe a quarter, if I, I can, if I may. Um, and uh, I came, um, not in 2012, I, I came, I was hired by Cornell in 2014, and I, I saw that, you know, the discussion here was, you know, um, focusing so much on coastal resilience, climate change. Uh, maybe, you know, some of you are a New Yorker, so maybe, you know, you're from Louisiana. So we have been discussing in several disciplines, you know, the effects and what we can do with that. Um, I'm, I'm not here to, you know, um, I think, um, offer a, a new perspective. What I'm trying to do now with, with my researchers um, is to try to understand what are the design tools, what is this uh, adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies that we have been developing in a very, very uh, intense timeline for um, uh, some strange reason, the timeline we have been created, it doesn't show. Uh, we tried several formats, so it doesn't matter. A anyway, it's incomplete, but you can see that so many competitions uh, happened in 2013, just after Sandy. And of course, since 2006, there were many initiatives from landscape architects and planners uh, and um, ecologists that were trying to understand how are we going to deal with our coast. And then just a, 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 a quick um, comment on how FEMA uh, is, is um, facing that. I'm, I'm very concerned about, you know, um, I mean, they're very specific about where the A zones are and where the V zones are and w how they define vulnerability. But I'm very, very concerned about, uh, you know, how simplified the housing typology is. Maybe it's because I'm, you know, European, but I, I don't think that we can um, 
continue, we can uh, think of uh, different ways of inhabiting the coast, thinking of a single family house um, and this kind of suburban densities that occupy our territories for many reasons. And I'm sure that you had ex experts that had talked about these issues better than I than I, than I can, so I'm not going to go better. So I'm going to go very, very quickly to a couple of, of um, um, experiences that I find very interesting, and, and, I, and I think they, in a way, talk about the, the best, um, um, in a way, um, not the best, are the interesting for, 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 for me and from my perspective. Um, this is from UPenn. Uh, I'm not going to uh, mention the data and all that, but I wanted to uh, talk about the very good understanding of topography, understanding where the ridges are, uh, and how we can possibly try to find models of inhabitation that are um, um, more linear and they're multifunctional. They address storage, they address activities, they address um, different programs, and they can also equip our, our city. So this is the idea of fingers of high ground uh, from the University of, of, of Pennsylvania. And um, at the same research program, uh, the University of um, uh, New York, um, Catherine Sivit Nordenson, uh, has been working at the Jamaica Bay, um, as you know, uh, and uh, uh, very, um, how can I say, um, underserved and deteriorated um, um, of huge uh, importance uh, ecological place that um, has been affected. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in you know the way that they imagine and they are now constructing some atoll terraces. Uh, in the inside of the bay, uh, working with um, uh, the American Corp of Engineers and using uh, parts of the immense dredging of the of the New York port, as as well as I'm very interested and I uh, think it's a, a wonderful challenge to see how they had reached out to different um, to different. Um, um, societies and movements and, 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 and groups. And so it has become a kind of a, a, collect, a new collective that uh, discusses of how to rebuild in a, in a resilient way. Uh, probably you are familiar with the Rebuild by Design competition. It's, it has so many materials. Um, it will take me, I think, a year, um, one year more to try to, to publish an article of that, which I'm, I'm not going to, to bore you with uh, some of the of the details, but I think that um, this has been a response to uh, to show what we can um, achieve with, with design. There are many winners. Uh, I have this map here. I'm interested in, you know, mostly interested in, in some of them. Uh, but I, I, I think that it's very important to see this inshore. Um, um, I tried to summarize that, like inshore and offshore, and some of the of the of, of the actions are are uh, working with both, which makes a very interesting, I think, understanding of how the coast is a is a kind of a deep section. It's not something that happens just in a very very um, narrow um, site. Um, we are, you know, there is. For me, it's, it's the, the, the technological version, like a challenge for designers to understand and defend lower Manhattan. Uh, I have no doubt that you know, it's, it's easy to create um, opportunities for, for defending um, an iconic place as it is with all the, you know, the, the political and, uh, and economic and social importance of that. What I'm doub doubting is if we will able to rebuild and and make safe all the rest of ordinary um, coastlines. And here is one of the other projects. Kedorf uh, explained this project here at Cornell in the past uh, from the practice of SCAPE. She's a professor at Columbia University. And what the interesting of her was to try also to work with history 
and um, remind um, people in Staten Island, but also in general New York, New Yorkers, the profound relationship um, the New Yorkers had with um, the city's estuaries and how with this um, double um, um, action of creating reefs, uh, improving ecologies on the bay and also um, working with schools and, and, and students, probably um, this oyster culture can, can create, uh, can dissipate, can defend and, and create, of course, uh, better, better landscapes. Um, a very, very short notice about, um, you know, the, the, the Netherlands. Um, this uh, Zandmotor, a, a very important um, project that creates um, adds 20 um, million cubic meters of sand on the shore, very close to Den Haag, in order to create protection um, uh, from from the sea. Again, uh, defends this idea of restoring habitat and and creating uh, new uh, opportunities for for defend, but. My, my question, and this would be probably you know, the, the last question, is um, of course, uh, in the short term, we need to build coastal resiliency for landscape architects. This means that we will have better places to live, uh, not just us, but uh, other inhabitants of this planet. We have to go back, we have to recover. Uh, the values of, of the different ecologies, and we have to learn how to rebuild them. We forgot, I think, to, to do that. And uh, the last 20 years we have been um, learning a lot, has been a very steep learning curve. But my, my question, maybe it's a kind of naive question, shouldn't we talk also about retreat? And um, uh, some very, very uh, incipient uh, thoughts uh, with... Um, Lauren and Alice Sturm and Adriana Hidalgo that we have been working for some months now. We tried at, uh, you know, to follow the Dutch paradigm and the Dutch are very systematic and we tried to, to look at, for example, New Jersey and try to, to see at the different typologies of the coast. Um, so uh, you can see, of course, the, this, this coast has been a coast that um, was um, uh, colonized in the late 18, 19th century with the, uh, this idea of resorts. It's, um, we have maps that, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that I can show that, but uh, how you know, the, the railways were um, uh, helping you know, the, the, the people to, to go to the coast and, and spend the, their summer times there. So we have been creating a series of, of, you know, just very, very quick ideas of what are the possibilities we have, you know, what we can do. We have to protect uh, because of probably, you know, the cultural value of some places that, that work with offshore interventions. Then we have many uh, parks which are vulnerable to flooding, but they have very low biodiversity. So probably we could, you know, restore and and create, you know, a, a better ability for for storing and of course increase biodiversity. We have many many high risk residential on the coast uh, areas on the coast. So probably we have to start thinking of retreat and start thinking of, you know, m more complex levels, not walls and um, that could probably help uh, dissipate. Um, we have, um, I don't know, s several situations. Uh, probably we need to build high rise, but in different typologies um, um, that are a little bit, I think, more contemporary and they offer uh, things that people really need, like to have a, an, a green space or to have a, a terrace and this is like a, as a, in a form of a caricature and a, um, but but for me and just to to finish um, uh, here I think that um, at least from my understanding the most important thing is to um, understand history understand how these places were built understand what happened before and uh, speculate uh, on new values of for the, for the coast. And I think this discussion of, of the values that the coast had before this uh, development, um, 
could it possibly trigger a comprehensive disciplinary discussion on coast adaptation and maybe, I don't know, nuances to very, very complex problematics. So these are some um, speculations about the loss of wetlands and, you know, when ever anything happened. We're trying to geo-referentiate or, or guess approximately, you know, how was this territory in the past. Um, and um, like the two newest ideas that we have is explore the condition of islandness. What does it mean? You're in an island, but you don't understand, you know, what this could be. So very quickly, these are like projections for future sea level rise. So if you look at the six feet sea level rise, you can you can feel that you know that this uh, understanding of, of continuous territory or urban place of Coney Island is not going to lo longer exist, so why not speculate a little bit more? But on the contrary, if you look at the inland inundation, then you see that, you know, the different areas and parts are, you know, affected. So this, if you, if you sum, for legibility reasons, we didn't overlay the two, but you can see how, um, how vulnerable all the all the island is and also you know because we are landscape architects we always look at the structure of the open spaces and the green spaces as these structures could probably inform a new idea of of um, 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 places that can absorb water that they can I don't know uh, changed and they can probably I don't know become more often wet or permanently wet. And here are some superpositions of some historical maps. These are rather um, recent maps already of the 20th century, but you can see the, the, the quantity of the, of, the, of the field land and how the, you know, the, the, re, the current perimeter of Coney Island has been thing. And this is my favorite map. Of, of the ones that we found from Coney Island. Um, we, uh, you see how complex the perimeter was, the Coney Creek was uh, still there. Um, the, most, the streets that are still part of the core and very close to the very famous iconic amusement park, which is an absolutely, I think, de decay, are, are still there. And the green shows how many wetlands you know, were related to, to the creek. So I, I, we feel that it's important to start visualizing this, this past, which is not like, I don't know, a million of years ago. It's just um, less than two centuries ago, and to start imagining things that are a little bit um, braver. Um, and I will just uh, finish with, with this uh, idea. Uh, we have been looking at Staten Island. I will go very quickly because um, speculating, but this map of 1900 of the US geology map shows how in 1900, um, the people, you know, wisely were occupying what is today Richmond Avenue and how, you know, they were uh, um, uh, um, reaching the coast in a kind of perpendicular way. That is the, this title of at right angles. Um, and maybe, you know, um, we are trying to um, kind of demonstrate that, understand the different layers of buyouts and, and of, uh, you know, the existing wetlands and, and the FEMA maps and all. Um, but um, but in, in Staten Island, uh, everyone has been talking of managed retreat because many people wanted to, to abandon because, of course, they were living in a place that had no, uh, never received any particular care or attention. And we think of, you know, a design retreat. Um, and I will, I will finish with uh, Port Grimaud. It's um, a, a tourist resort of a very ambitious tourist resort that was built in the, in the 60s. And it's still there. You can visit it if you go to the south of France. But I think that um, when the political will was to create um, in imitations of Venice or places that would have a, um, that convey the authenticity, you know, the contemporary uh, quality tourists would like to have in order to understand the conditions of of of, of this landscape and and try to um, let's say 
um, and, and be in a different relationship with, with this newly designed landscape, we were able, uh, with competitions and with important commissions, to build um, places which are also still, I think, very interesting. I keep imagining uh, these um, um, clusters that have no cars, and they work with uh, renewable energy, and they are uh, interpret the, the wet conditions of the coastal uh, areas, and um, uh, people that you know, low-income people, uh, could have a place there. Uh, it's it's an agreement. You know, it's a political decision. It's not just um, an issue of of uh, real estate market, and um, and maybe um, these situations can can happen a little bit. Big uh, back in the hinterland, uh, leaving um, nature to to behave um, as as it will. Uh, thank you very much for for your attention. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.